the Flinders Ranges, it is one of the jewels in the crown of Australian geology. This region has some spectacular exposures of some of the most important episodes in planetary evolution of Earth. And it is the subject of the current bid for world heritage status. I've gathered here a group of fantastic researchers from the University of Adelaide to talk about some of the important and interesting aspects of Flinders Ranges geology. Joining me are Professor Alan Collins, Dr. Catherine Amos, currently head of school, the Australian School of Petroleum and Energy Resources, and Georgina Virgo, one of the PhD researchers within the group. Thanks for joining me. Uh, Alan, you're a very well-traveled geologist. Hmm. Tell me, you know, how does the Flinders Ranges rate? How does it rate in terms of the world's geology? No, well, that's, that's interesting, isn't it? Because the Flinders, I mean, the, the rocks of the Flinders Ranges preserve this incredible story of really how our whole Earth system evolved, what makes us different from a planet that, that could have microbes on. So if we find microbes on Mars, it will be what, what our Earth would have been like Mars three billion years ago. Um, but it's what makes it different from that. It's, 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 it's this sort of change of, change of the planet from this sort of quite relatively dull, very low oxygen, only life being single cellular mm. bacteria really dominating the world to, you know, 500 million years later, a blink of an eye later, <laughs> we suddenly have, you know, multicellular life. We mm. have animals, we have life on land, mm. we have oxygen levels you could breathe. And it all happens through the time period of the rocks of the Flinders Ranges. And it's those rocks that preserve the evidence for that. There's not really anywhere else in the world, certainly not anywhere as accessible as the Flinders, where you can, you can see all those stories written in the rocks. Mm. Um, so that's what that's what makes it special. That's what keeps you coming back. That's what keeps me coming back. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Hey, Catherine, if if you were to describe the Flinders Ranges to someone who had never been there before, what would you say to them? I think it wouldn't be so much about the rocks, about the but for the beauty. <laughs> it is sure. stunningly beautiful. The Flinders Ranges. I uh, hadn't ever been into the Flinders Ranges um, a few years ago, but I had driven past them a mm. lot uh, to do research up in further north in in northern South Australia. And I just knew I had to get in there and look at those rocks because they were just so beautiful. Yeah, yeah. That that drive along the western side when you come out of from Hawker out to the north and you look yeah. out to the to the to the, yeah. to the western side of mm. Wilpena Pound it really is quite a stunning, stunning landscape. Yeah. Spectacular. So Catherine, as a sedimentologist, so you've worked in lots of those modern environments, like you were mm. mentioning your research up north and you know, lakes and rivers and basins, but when you look at the sedimentary record in the Flinders Ranges itself, is there are there unique features? Are there something you know? What's what sort of stimulated and captured interest in the Flinders Ranges sedimentology? Oh, so there are there are unique things in the Flinders Ranges that make them really special. But I think to understand the unique things, the thing that's really super amazing about looking at rocks that are six hundred million years old is that so much of them is familiar. Mm -hmm. So there's the, the big picture controls of, of our planet haven't changed you know some of them have in really massive ways but some of them haven't so much so you can look at rocks in the in the flinders ranges and we know that there was land and there were oceans and rain fell on the land and mm. it formed rivers and, and the sediment got transported through those rivers into the oceans in a not too dissimilar way mm. to what we can see on the surface so of Earth we now. wouldn't be completely out of place if we were dropped oh, back well in we it. would be yeah. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> this is the thing so, we, <laughs> well, we would still see ripples from the, from the well so funny you should mention ripples so i there are some beautiful ripples exposed in rocks in the flinders ranges so you know if you go to the beach now and walk along the beach and you can see these these ripples preserved um that have been formed by the waves we can go and look at, at ancient surfaces, hundreds of millions of year, years old in the Flinders, with these perfectly preserved ripples. And we can look at them, we can compare them to ripples on a beach here in Adelaide. And, and we can interpret then that, mm. that those rocks, you know, however many, you know, 600 odd million years ago, uh, would have been formed on a beach with waves swooshing backwards and forwards. So we can see all those things that are similar and we can build a picture of mm. what the landscapes mm. were like. But there's some big differences. So, you know, the evolution of life is, is probably the biggest one. Yeah. So if you look at landscapes on Earth now, there's, there's plants growing, there are trees growing, you know, there's, there's fish in the water, there's, there's animals, humans, you know, none of those things existed at the time. Complex life, we only mm -hmm. had very simple life um, at, at that time. So, so there's a lot that would have been different. Um, you know, the shape of the rivers would have been different. And, and we can pick those clues up. One of the other really cool things that we can see in the Flinders Ranges is evidence in the sedimentary layers of how tides, the tidal cycles wow. are different. Yep. So 
when tides go in and out, and that's because of the uh, relationship between the position of the Earth and the sun and the moon, so gravity is moving water backwards and forwards, when that water goes in and out, it moves sand and mud with it. So we get these layers of, of sand and mud that can be deposited, and they can tell us, so we know that a day has gone past when mm -hmm. we've got a little pair of, of those layers. And from the rocks in the Flinders Ranges, people have studied those, those layers, they've counted lots and lots of these tiny little layers. <laughs> Patiently um, counting it <laughs> Would have taken a long time. Absolutely. But from that, we know that, that back around 600 million years ago, uh, there were something like 400 days in the year. And I think there were 13 months in the year. Wow. Um, yep. Things were different. Yeah. And, yep. and we can get those clues from the rocks, even though it was such a very long time ago. There's it's some familiar pretty mind blowing. Things. Yeah, some familiar things, but a lot is quite different. So yep. are you say even the rivers themselves were different then? Yes, they would have been. So there's, there's research that has been done by, by other teams, and they've looked at, at evidence from the rock record from all over the world, from different periods of geologic time. And from that, um, there's a pretty clear picture coming through that, that in the, the earliest kind of phases of, of Earth, before we had lots of land plants um, evolving, that we, we didn't get lots of meandering rivers. Oh. So the, the, the rivers that meander and curve through, through muddy floodplains that usually have lots of trees growing on the banks, yep, yep, yep. The, the roots of that vegetation is stabilizing. The, the ground and it's enabling those rivers to have those curvy shapes and to move like that. So before all of those plants evolved, then we probably had rivers that were a lot straighter right. um, with, with quite different characteristics. Wow, wow. And so, Alan, what is the kind of bigger geological setting for all these sediments and why are they even there? What, what, what kicked off this, this huge accumulation of sedimentary rock? Yeah, it's a good question. It's really the start of the Pacific Ocean. So... Most of these sediments lie in a big sort of depression, a tectonic depression, just like the East African Rift, if you like, in, 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 in Africa. Um, and here it's formed because something rifted off, moved away from Australia, broke up this pre-existing supercontinent that goes by the name of Rodinia, um, and we created an ocean basin. So just to the east of the Adelaide Hills, um, over just to the east of, sort of Broken Hill, we'd have created a, a big cast this, this supercontinent asunder and created an ocean basin. And that's the same basin we have today, that's the Pacific Ocean. Um, North America is the most likely candidate that rifted off. Some people suggest bits of China, but um, I'm very much in the camp that thinks it was North America that rifted off. And that created, first of all, yes, a little rift valley, and then that broke off and formed a passive margin. So we then ended up having something that was a bit more like, I suppose, the Coral Sea or something mm -hmm. like that, a, 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 a series of sediments being deposited out into a big hole, the big ocean basin out mm -hmm. to the east. Uh, and and, and that, that they're, what, they're what have been preserved in those rocks. So we can see in the earliest parts of those rocks, a lot of evidence for this, there's some volcanics, there's, the, the sediments are very patchy, if you like, so they're just filling in local depressions. And then later on, when we get higher in the sequence, we start to see much more continuous right. formations as, right. as the... As the as the sea transgressed over large areas of, of, of eastern, what was then eastern Australia, we were then on the east coast of Australia. And why are they now exposed and tilted? Well, uh, yes, yeah, a long time ago when these rocks were formed, they were formed from about 850 million years to around about 500 million years ago. And then about 500 million years ago, we had that, that ocean basin wasn't quite so passive anymore. We had, we had subduction occurring. Um, oceans have a lifespan. Mm -hmm. They they get so old and then they get cold and they get heavy and fall down into the mantle and we start to get a subduction zone. Um, and that, in this part of the world, is known as the Delamerian orogeny and that created mountains, created um, igneous rocks, pumping pumping through the, pushing through the sediments, compressed them, deformed them, turned them into mountains. But even those got eroded down um, over, over the, the millions of years. And then just in the last two or three million years, we've had reactivation of some of these prominent faults that have just popped it up. So the, the at present day, it is being uplifted as, as almost a series of wedges. Mm. Yeah. So the current day... The sprigorogeny, uh, as the it's current, sometimes called. <laughs> the sprigorogeny. This current day mountain building episode is reactivating these old weaknesses. Exactly. Okay, yeah. formed. And some of those weaknesses would have also formed from the original... Yeah, oh, that's right. rifting, right? Exactly. Good point. Um, some of these, these, these most major active faults now, and the, some of the controlling faults during the Delamerian, yeah, they were the old rift faults. They mm. were the old extensional normal faults. 
Norwest Fault is a great example of that up in the northern part of the Flinders. Fantastic. Georgie, bring you in here. Um, we've talked a bit about um, the sedimentology of the region. We've talked about lunar, you know, impacts on the, on, um, on the kind of, you know, the rock record. But there's another big thing in the Flinders Ranges, and that is this concept of snowball earth yeah. and some big glacial events. So I guess the really question for you is, how cold was it? How many <laughs> how many layers of woolen underwear will I have needed if you'd I was need, around? Yeah, you'd need a few. And, and, and we <laughs> were close day. to the equator at the time, but it was still cold. It was how, still very cold. I mean, this right. was a global event. Yeah. And, and what's I, what sort of time are we we talking about here? It's about seven hundred million years ago. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it was interesting because it was so long lasting. I mean, we have these fluctuations in the climate that we can see in the record. We have ice houses and more, I guess, global warming type houses, and yet. Yeah, in this particular time period, you know, the first glaciation, the one that I'm looking at, the start of the cryogenian, the Sturtian glaciation, mm -hmm. was over 50 million years. That's a long time for the earth to be as cold as in, it was. In the deep freeze. In the deep freeze, yeah. And it's interesting to look at what the world was like before that. You know, it was pretty similar to what we know today. Cold polar regions, nice warm equator, and then it all changed. We went into this huge ice house and coming out of it, we see this sort of evolution of life. So it's very fascinating. And I love the fact that there's evidence for it on all continents, and we have some of the best examples in South Australia. What is the specific thing that you've been looking at in terms of the, the cryogeny and the deep freeze? So I guess I'm trying to piece together how the environment's changed before the Ice Age, through the Ice Age, and then coming out of it, using both sedimentology and Catherine's expertise, but also trying to look at the geochemistry and piece um. together this story, both on what the, the rock evidence is on how it looked. Do they have ripples? Was it a beach? but also what was the actual chemistry of that water column? Mm. And what can that tell us about why this might have happened? Amazing. It, um, and, and there's plenty of glaciers floating around at that time as well, I presume? Oh, yeah, everywhere. <laughs> yeah, it was very cold. I mean, it would have been it's very hard to imagine as well because what we know of the Flinders Ranges now is this desert. <laughs> so Absolutely. it's almost like the exact opposite. It's, opposite. it's really hard to imagine, but um, I think it's really fascinating and I think it's interesting to try and imagine what the world was like because it is hard to use a modern analogue because it was so dis dissimilar to what we know today. Mm -hmm. The Sturtian is the glaciation and it's it's actually recorded or well, first demonstrated here. Uh, whereabouts is that, the, well, the record of that? Well, I believe that um, it was discovered, these glacial deposits, over 100 years ago in South Australia. Mm. And then through time we sort of started to see these very similar deposits on other continents. And then once we were able to date these rocks, we realised that they were of similar age and this may have been more than just a local glaciation in South Australia. This was um, something that was happening over the entire world and that's where we started to build this noble earth hypothesis. But was it Mawson who first? Houchin. Houchin, there you go. <laughs> Pre-Mawson, yeah. Pre-Mawson. Mm. I think it was like 1901 yeah, he oh, wrote a paper right. yeah. which was describing these glacial rocks for the first time. Yeah, amazing stuff. So we've talked about differences in environment, differences in kind of evolution, you know, in, in sedimentology, but there's actually an extraterrestrial <laughs> component to the Flinders Ranges geology as well, Alan. There is, yes. There's uh, an incredible uh, meteorite or some sort of bollard, bollard, hit South Australia, hit it at a place called Lake Akron in the Gawler Ranges, round, well, sometime in the Ediacaran, which is the last of the three periods of the Neo-Proterozoic. Mm, which is how many millions of years? Uh, it's from 635 to 541. <laughs> to be precise. Yes, but we hadn't really got a huge, a really good age on the this impact. It's quite hard to date. They can be really quite tricky to date um, impacts. The impact but through, itself? Yeah, yeah, the impact itself. But what we just see in the Flinders, and this has been found for 20 or 30 years mm. by people like Vic Gostin, are these... The, the, the results of that impact, the debris from that impact um, throughout a, a very distinctive layer throughout the Flinders Ranges, all through it. We tried to have a go at dating some of the really, really fine sediments that you see, which we actually think were once glass. They were once the sort of molten rock that sort of got showered the area and then have turned to really, really fine clay. Um, we've been de developing a whole lot of new sort of techniques here in Adelaide to, to try and date Proterozoic sediments. Um, so we applied one of these, Rubidium strontium dating, using a laser. Uh, and we got a very good age of 580 million years right on that layer. The really cool thing is when you just look at the shales either side of it, just 10 centimetres mm -hmm. either side of it, 
then you get much different ages because there you're actually just dating the, the normal detrital clays that oh, are washed wow. into it. Wow, yeah. Um, so we can see that we get these really old ages mm -hmm. either side of it, and then when you actually date the layer itself, wow. you get an age that is consistent with the actual impact. So we're pretty confident we've dated that impact now. So paint us a picture for what it would have looked <laughs> like. I mean, it, it, this is you're talking about the Gawler Craton, which is yep. the big uh, Proterozoic Archean block to the west of this huge rift system. Yeah, that's right. A big so this impact, would have... big meteorite of some. How do you know how big it was? Uh, <laughs> Are we talking? We like... probably do, but I don't. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's not. It's Somebody not like. Knows. It's not like. It's not as. We don't think it's as big as the sort of the impact that killed out, killed the, um, right. killed the dinosaurs. Right. But it's not a huge amount less. So I'm going to go with the sort of the a few hundred meter scale. So wow. so quite a large thing. Something you would definitely have noticed. You would have noticed, yeah. And and of course we were on this nice <laughs> balmy eastern margin of Australia, Pacific Pacific coast. Ocean washing in yeah, beautiful absolutely waves. Absolutely lovely and warm. We'll have a few sort of bits of bacteria, you know, a bit, few, few bacteria. Actually, algae. Algae yeah, had started yeah. to take over from yeah. bacteria by then. And then yes, this uh, this monster from outer space. Boom. Yes, yeah. and. Uh, sprayed this whole area full of debris, lots of bits of blocks of the Gawler Range volcanics and things throughout the uh, throughout the region. It would have been um it would have been exciting. In fact, right on top of those debris we see that some really lovely cross beds, cross bedded sands which are thought to be the sort of tsunami deposits oh, after the impact. A wave, a big, big wave big system has yeah, gone through. Exactly. Wow. Amazing really stuff. It, the Flinders Range has really got everything They've actually got everything, when you think yeah. about it. So, given just how diverse and how amazing it is, this is some of the subjects we've touched on there. What what do you think? Um, what are some of the big opportunities for Australia or South Australia, mm -hmm. given this amazing landscape is here in our backyard? <laughs> you want me to go for it? Oh, there's tons. I think we yeah. can all pitch in all the way from pure science and understanding more about our, our planet mm. and, and actually applying that knowledge to other systems. So I think everybody will have seen the amazing footage coming back from Mars at the moment. We can see from the patterns of sediments, you know, the deposits of, of river systems uh, into bodies of water. And that's not too different to, to things we see on Earth now. But the, the things we see right now are influenced by life. Whereas in the Flinders sure. Ranges, yep. we know that those systems wouldn't have had complex life so is maybe more similar to the things we see on Mars to interpret. So there's a lot of really pure uh, kind of science that we sure. can understand. From an applied perspective, the, there, there's so many minerals and um, fluid resources in the, in the Flinders Ranges. So geothermal energy is one possibility. There are so many different aspects of, of those rocks which could potentially give us energy in the future um, and, and help us to, you know, to continue living high quality <laughs> lives. <laughs> um, yeah. yeah, for sure. Anything? Oh, um, look, I think South Australian government and the Australian government's putting it forward as a World Heritage listing, and I think it's an absolute no-brainer. Um, I'm amazed it hasn't been done before. Um, when you think about the stories in those rock wreck, those rocks mm -hmm. about, as I say, how our planet is different from every other terrestrial planet, how we see those rocks tell us stories about algae taking over from bacteria. They, te they tell us stories of life, fungi taking over um, land. They tell us stories about oxygen in the atmosphere getting to levels that we we could breathe, and of course they have the Ediacaran fossils right at the top of them, the sort of the, the cherry on the top, if you like. Mm. The whole records there. They're, I'm not aware of anywhere else in the world, and as I say, certainly nowhere that you can get to as easily as you can as these mm. rocks, and are so understudied. Mm. Um, it, it's it's an absolute no brainer for world heritage just mm. on that alone, let alone the cultural landscapes, the sure. beautiful, the, the beauty of the landscapes. And, and the biology that's that's through there, um, staggering place. Get out there and visit it. I'd Absolutely. say. Absolutely. <laughs> fantastic. Well, thank you very much, Georgie, Catherine, and Alan. Thanks for joining me. It's fantastic to talk about the wonderful Flinders Ranges. Thank you. Thanks Pleasure. for having us.